Thank you for inviting me once again to speak at Yahoo. Um, I'm PPK, Peter Paul Koch, but everybody calls me PPK. It's a long story. Uh, I run a site called quirksmode.org uh, where you can find uh, information about browser incompatibilities. And I have a Twitter account, obviously, who doesn't? And today uh, at Yahoo, I'm going to talk about uh, JavaScript events. And I sincerely hope I can teach you something. And that's always uh, the question when I speak for a Yahoo audience, because you guys already know so much. Uh, I have no idea what I can contribute to it. But anyway, we're going to give it a try. And I'm going to talk about JavaScript events. Um, it was about uh, a year ago uh, that I started some serious, serious uh, research into JavaScript events. And I published uh, some compatibility tables. Uh, what I basically was doing was um, testing the compatibility of all the common events uh, in all the common browsers. And that, uh, su uh, several uh, things surprised me when I did that uh, research. And some of the th these uh, things are what I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you don't know it, my compatibility table is here at quirksmode.org slash dumb slash events. Uh, use it to look up, look up some uh, complicated uh, event stuff that you want to know about. Today, we're going to talk about four uh, things. First of all, I'm going to give a quick introduction to the key events uh, because there is some confusion sometimes about exactly how they work. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about the change event. Uh, it's one of my absolute favorite events uh, in the whole of JavaScript. Unfortunately, it hardly works, and I'm going to talk about that. Thirdly, I'm going to uh, talk about delegating the focus event. Um, event delegation, you'll probably know about that. I'm going to give a very uh, short introduction later on. Event delegation usually works only with uh, mouse and key events, but I found a way to uh, have it work with focus and other interface events too, and I'd like to share that with you. And finally, I'm going to present the first results of uh, my test of mobile events. Um, and the results are weird, I can tell you that already. I'll show you later on. But first, the key events. Um, it all seems so simple. There are three key events, key down, key press, and key up. And um, it, people generally think they know exactly when they fire. Um, I'm here to tell you that it isn't always as clear as you think it is. Let's go th uh, through some quick definitions. Um, the key down event fires when a key is depressed by the user and it keeps on firing as long as the user keeps it depressed. Well, that's simple. The key press event basically does the same, mm. except that it fires only when a character key is depressed. In other words, a key that will lead to a character being inserted into, say, a text area. Finally, the key up event fires when the user releases the key. Well, that sounds pretty simple. Just uh, to make absolutely sure that everybody understands, if I press, say, an O key or an I key or uh, one of these strange bracket keys, both a key down and a key press event will fire. On the other hand, if I uh, <laughs> press special keys such as the shift key or the arrow keys, only a key down event will fire. Um, this uh, theory of the difference between key down and key press uh, originated with Microsoft. Uh, all uh, the Internet Explorer versions uh, actually uh, use uh, this difference between key down and key press. And uh, Safari has copied it as from version 3.1, I think, which was released about uh, a year ago, maybe slightly more. Um, the point is here that uh, this uh, theory is the only theory about the difference between key down and key press in existence. Uh, in contrast, Opera and Firefox just fire lots of events at you all the time because it is tradition that there is both a key down and a key press event, so we should fire both whenever we see an opportunity, which is fun and which is fine, but it doesn't explain why there should be two events instead of just one, the key down event. So that's why I uh, kind of like uh, this uh, theory of the difference between key down and key press. So let's repeat it one more, once more. Key down fires when a key, any key, is depressed. Key press fires when a character key is depressed. And as you can see here, um, it works in IE and in Safari. Oh, and I don't have uh, Google Chrome icons here yet, but assume that uh, anything that works in Safari also works in Google Chrome. They're really quite close, these two browsers. <coughs> OK, so let's move on to some practical questions. Uh, usually, when you write uh, a script that detects uh, user keys, you want to know which key the user pressed and do some uh, interesting interface stuff uh, based on that. 
Um, now, there are two properties uh, that any key event uh, carries. Those are the key code and the uh, car code uh, properties. And there are also two bits of data you might want to know about, uh, the key code and the character code. Um, and the difference is the key code is the actual code of the physical key the user depresses, and the character code is the code of the ca uh, resulting character. So if I press an A key, uh, I get uh, key code 65, because uh, the, the A key has code 65, but the character code is 97 for a lowercase a. If I press a shift key, I get key code 16, because that's shift, but I do not get a character code, because uh, the shift key by itself doesn't result in any character. Well, that sounds simple. Uh, so we have one property, and we have, we have actually two properties and two bits of data. And having one property contain one bit of data and the other property, the other, would of course be far and far too simple. It would uh, mean that you don't need uh, specialized front-end engineers, that anyone can just write a key uh, script, which is obviously not the idea. So um, what exactly is going on? It's pretty complicated, actually. And frankly, I do not understand entirely why it should work like this, but it does work like this. The key code property. Um, on, with a key down event, on key down it contains the key code, the code of the physical key the user depresses. On key press, on the other hand, it contains the character code, basically the ASCII code of the, pressed, uh, of the character that appears on the screen. Um, this works in all browsers, except that Firefox um, on key press shows zero for key code. Don't ask me why. Um, then car code. Um, on key down, car code returns zero, and on key press, car code returns the character code. And this too works only in Firefox and Safari because these are the only browsers to support car code. Um, let's move on to some, uh, something really practical. If you need uh, the actual key that the user depressed, the physical key, use the key down event and ask for the key code. That will work in all browsers. On the other hand, if you need the character, the user has just entered in a text area or whatever, you should use the key press event and ask for either key code or car code. One of them will uh, contain the information you're looking for in any browser. Finally, um, sometimes you want to prevent the default action of key. I'm especially thinking of uh, arrow keys. Suppose you have a um, keyboard accessible drag and drop menu and then you want the, uh, the user to be able to uh, manipulate the dragged element by the, uh, the arrow keys, and you want to cancel the default of the arrow keys, namely scrolling the page. Um, basically, you should do that on key down, because, as I said before, key down fires when any key is depressed, and key press only fires when character keys are being depressed. Unfortunately, this does not work in Opera. I must admit, I didn't test it in the latest Opera, so it might, might have changed there. Um, and uh, preventing arrow keys in Opera is something I'm not going to talk about today because, frankly, I forgot the answer. That uh, concludes uh, the key events. It is not really complicated, all those key events, but you have to be uh, aware of the difference between key down and key press. Now, the change event. In theory, the change event would be absolutely wonderful to have because the change event fires when the value of a form field is changed. Um, Often you want to um, detect uh, everything the user does in a form. For instance, uh, on form submission, you of, of course want to uh, uh, go through all uh, form fields and validate them. But there's also, uh, also ways of getting, uh, making a form or form fields, checkboxes for instance, a, a kind of a menu that the uh, user can use to go through a complicated uh, interface. And what you want to do always is see what exactly did the user change in the form. And in theory, the change event would be absolutely wonderful for that. Um, but usually, uh, we are forced to use the focus and blur events instead, of may or maybe the click event uh, in the case uh, of uh, detecting uh, checkbox changes, because the change event doesn't w work quite correctly. Um, we have to distinguish uh, three uh, different uh, cases. First of all, the change event on text fields, second on select boxes, and third on checkboxes and radios. We start with text fields. 
Uh, suppose the user focuses on a text field in any way, uh, either by the mouse or by the keyboard, and then blurs again. Uh, in other words, he moves on to the next field. In that case, no change, change event fires, because there's nothing uh, that has changed. The value of the, of the text field has not been mo modified. Now, if we change it slightly, if we say, OK, the user focuses on the text field, then enters something, and then blurs the text field, uh, then a change event fires. At the moment, the user blurs the text field because the value of the text field has been modified and uh, that uh, obviously causes a, cha a change event. This is all good. This works perfectly in all browsers. However, when we come to select boxes, we start to encounter some difficulties. Um, the change event on select boxes is, of course, about the oldest JavaScript event uh, you can think of. Uh, back, I think even back in 95, 96, we already used uh, select box navigations, you know, with a nice uh, list of links you can go to, and uh, you put it in a select box because it takes uh, up uh, less screen uh, real estate, stuff like that. Uh, we've been uh, using uh, the change event for ages there, and it works, provided you use a mouse. With the mouse, it's all pretty simple. Uh, the first click on the select box uh, opens up uh, all the options. And the second click uh, selects a new option. And as, as soon as a new option has been selected, a change event fires, because the browser is now sure, OK, the user has changed the value of the form field. Um, this works, as I said, from at least 1996 onwards. It works in all browsers. Select boxes have also a way of um, uh, being of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the user al also has a way to use the keyboard to uh, enter select boxes. And then the situation gets much more complicated. Not at first. Uh, the first step the user has to take, obviously, is uh, focusing on the select box. Uh, and then he can use the arrow keys to go through the options and select the one he wants, which is all fine. Except that as soon as the user presses an arrow key once, a change event fires in IE and Opera. And that is, of course, a huge problem. Suppose you have a list of, say, 20 options, and the user wants to select the 20th one. Then he has to go uh, through the, the option list uh, option by option, presses the arrow key 19 times, and a change event fires 19 times. You do not want to, work, uh, to write a workaround for that. This is, as far as I'm concerned, a se pretty serious bug in IE and Opera. Instead, what should happen, and what uh, Firefox and Safari actually do, is they just allow the user to use the arrow keys to scroll through the select box. And only when the user blurs the select box, in other ways says, OK, I'm ready now. I've selected the option I want. Only then a change event is fired. And this is, of, of course, the correct way of doing it. Still, um, the, the, uh, the problem with IE means that select box navigations or similar stuff is pretty dangerous to write because it can misfire horribly uh, when the user uses the keyboard. And that's uh, the first really, really serious problem we encounter with the change event. If we go to checkboxes and radios, it becomes even worse. Uh, I'm going to use a checkbox <coughs> as an example, but it basically works the same for radios. Um, a click on a checkbox, and I do, do not mean necessarily a mouse click, but an activate event that can be fired either by the mouse or by the keyboard. A click event uh, on a checkbox, of course, changes the value of, uh, of the check property, goes from true to false, or vice versa. And what should happen is that a change event fires right then and there, because the user has actually cha changed something. And the change event does fire in Firefox, Safari, and Opera, but not in IE. What happens in IE? You click on this checkbox, nothing happens. What's going on? You first have to blur the checkbox. You have to go somewhere else, either with your mouse or with your keyboard, and only when the checkbox has been blurred, then the change event fires, which is, of course, uh, totally horrible for any sort of interface that wants to use uh, lots of uh, checkboxes, for instance, to fold stuff out or in. The user wants to check this checkbox, and immediately the thing he expects folds out or folds in. Um, this IE bug means that we cannot use the change event for this. We have to use a click event. That's not such a terrible uh, problem. 
but uh, it's once again uh, a pretty annoying bug <laughs> in IE. Oh, and you also see uh, that I've uh, crossed out the W3C logo. That's because, uh, as far as I know, the event specification only talks about blurring. As according to uh, the event specification, uh, a change event should fire when a certain uh, uh, form field ha has been changed and is blurred. And as we saw right now, that makes perfect sense for text fields. It makes perfect sense for select boxes when you use the keyboard, but it does not make sense for checkboxes and radios or for select boxes when you use the mouse. So this is a kind of a problem we're having right now, and frankly, I don't see a really easy solution for it. Fortunately, we can usually uh, get along with uh, either the click events or the focus and blur events. It's not such a huge uh, thing to work around, but still, I would love the change events to become really, really useful. Because what we could do then is say, okay, we've got this form here, and it has a um, uh, text field, and it has uh, select boxes, and check boxes, and stuff. And any change event in the form uh, will be detected by a central script, and so, uh, some night script will be executed. That would be absolutely wonderful, in my opinion, but we can't do that right now because of the problems uh, I sketched here. <coughs> Our third subject today is event dele delegation. I'm absolutely sure that you all uh, already know what event delegation is, for, but for the people at home, I'd like to give a very short introduction. Some slightly new material will come later on. Basically, event delegation um, is uh, a way of uh, of uh, defining less event handlers. Um, and uh, we take um, a drop-down menu as an example. Uh, of course, a drop-down menu, in theory, would need a lot of event handlers. If you mouse over this A, then that, uh, then that sub menu should uh, drop down, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all that. Um, what we do in event delegation is uh, make use of the fact that many events bubble up. That is, as soon as uh, you uh, the user mouses over uh, a link, uh, the mouse over event, if any, on the, the link itself fires, and then the event bubbles up all the way to the document level, triggers any event handler for the mouse over on the LI, on the UL, etc., etc., all the way up to the document. The point here is that the mouse over and the mouse out event will bubble up to the UL anyway, so why shouldn't we handle the event there? Uh, basically, it saves you a lot of event handlers. I once um, had a client who complained that his site was a bit slow, especially in IE. So I came there, I took a look at the code, and I discovered that they had this huge drop-down menu with 60 or 70 links or so, and every single link had, had its own mouse over and mouse out event. And yes, that makes your site a bit slower, because uh, obviously uh, all browsers have to allocate memory to every single event handler they encounter. Besides, there's of course the infamous uh, IE memory leak, where, and of course that was in full force there. Uh, they did not do anything uh, like removing the events uh, when the page unloads. So uh, they had a terrible mess there. And I taught them uh, about event uh, delegation, it really only took me 10 minutes, and the site worked a lot better then. So basically what we do, if we create a drop-down menu, uh, the drop-down uh, variable contains the UL, the top-level element of the drop-down. You uh, assign one mouse over and one mouse out event to that UL. Simple. And it works in all browsers, by the way. But suppose somebody doesn't use a mouse, but a keyboard. How shall we make the menu fold out then? And that brings us to the supremely important topic of device independence. Uh, device independence is something I'm uh, trying to explain uh, to as many people as possible, because it's just important. Uh, back in the bad old days, uh, we used to think that everybody used a mouse, and people who didn't use a mouse were yeah, kind of a bit strange people, and we didn't really have to pay attention to them. Fortunately, that has changed now. Um, we also want to accommodate our keyboard users. So basically, this does not work for people with a keyboard because we use a mouse event. Basically, the general rule is any uh, event that has mouse in its name works only when you actually use a mouse. Sounds simple, but my, many people overlook that fact. So we need events uh, that tell us whether the user enters or leaves a link by means of the keyboard. And those are, of course, the focus and blur events. 
So we would like to do this. We would like to say, OK, if uh, a mouse over event bubble, bubbles up to the root of our drop-down menu, or if a focused event bubbles up to the root of our drop-down menu, then we execute this function, and either the mouse out or the blah event uh, execute that function. The problem is that this does not work, because the focus and blur events do not bubble up. Which brings us to the question, which events do bubble up and which events don't? Um, basically, you should uh, distinguish two kinds of events. First, the mouse and the key events, and secondly, the interface events. Mouse and key events are uh, events that fire when the user initiates a device-specific action. I'm still working on this uh, definition, but this should be uh, roughly correct. Basically, what the user does uh, is either press a mouse key, or press a keyboard key, or move the mouse, or do something else that is clearly associated with a specific device. Uh, examples are mouse over, mouse out, click, key down, key press, etc. Uh, by the way, the click event is the only event that fires both with the mouse and with the keyboard. If you click on a link with the mouse, the click event fires. If you uh, move to a link by means of uh, tabbing uh, until the focus is on the link, and then you hit enter or the spacebar, then a click event also fires. The click event is uh, one of the very few events that is truly device independent. So a click event is always safe. All the other events I'm mentioning here are device specific. And the general rule for these events is that they bubble up all the way to the document level. Interface events, on the other hand, they fire when a certain event takes place regardless of how that event was initialized. And uh, the best example of that is a form submission. As soon as a form is submitted, a submit event fires. Uh, and it does not matter exactly how the user has submitted that form. He could uh, go uh, to the uh, submit button with the mouse and click on it, or tap all the way through the form to the submit button and hit enter, uh, or uh, be in a uh, text field and also hit, en hit enter because that also submits a form. It does not matter exactly how the user submits the form, which uh, three of these, these methods he uses, a submit event will always fire. And that's the general idea of the interface events. Uh, other examples include load, change, focus, and blur. And of course, we are on the hunt for focus and blur here, because we want to make our drop-down menu device independent. In general, interface events do not bubble. And that's bad news for us, because uh, if we want to make our drop-down menu keyboard accessible, we have to do this. We have to go through all the links in the entire drop-down menu and add a focus and a blur event to it. And that's not what we want to hear, because we want to use nice event delegation that uh, concentrates all the events on the top level of the drop-down menu. Fortunately, and this was a real surprise for me when I found this out, fortunately there is a workaround. And that workaround centers on event capturing instead of event blur, uh, bubbling. Event capturing is uh, the exact opposite of event bubbling. And it is supported in all uh, standards compliant browsers, which excludes IE, unfortunately. But we'll get to, uh, back to IE later on. Um, this is event bubbling. Uh, I already said that. Uh, if you uh, click on the A, the event starts on the A, bubbles up to the LI, to the UL, etc., etc., all the way up to the document level. Event capturing, on the other hand, starts at the document level and then moves its way down through the UL, the LI, and the A, and ends here. Now, in practice, there's not so terribly much difference between event capturing and event bubbling. Um, I myself would say that there uh, is really no difference at all, but uh, when I said that to uh, Dean Edwards uh, back in London, he said, oh, no, 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 we do absolutely need event capturing for certain situations. And of course, I believe him, so uh, event capturing does as it uses. Um, the point is, and this is a really strange point, the point is that if you capture a focus event, event handlers on the, uh, the target element's ancestors are executed. And this was uh, really weird for me. This works in all browsers, well, except for IE, of course, because it doesn't support event capturing. So basically, if we focus uh, on a link uh, while we use event bubbling, only the, fo the on focus event handler of that link will fire, and then the event will stop. But if we do the opposite, if we use event capturing, 
then the uh, on-focus event handler of the document, all the way down to the UL, the LI, and the A, they are all executed. And um, why uh, is there this difference between event capturing and event bubbling? I'm afraid I have absolutely no clue. I discovered it uh, in, well, I think I was testing Opera at the moment, and I thought, okay, well, this must be something specific to Opera, interesting. Let's test it in Firefox. Hey, wow, it works there too. Safari, oh my god, it works there too. Is this something cross-browser? And yes, it turned out to be an actual cross-browser uh, thing taking place. Um, which kind of um, led me to think that it may, may become time to have uh, event bubbling and event capturing at the same. Because uh, in my opinion, it doesn't really make sense for an event to be able to ca be captured, but not to bubble up. Uh, in any case, uh, the current situation does not really make sense, but it's pretty useful to our problem at hand, because we can now use event delegation for the focus and blur events too. What we do, very simple, is this. We add an event listener, we use the actual add event listener syntax, and we give the, uh, the last argument as true, which means that this event fires in the capturing phase, which means that as soon as any focus event occurs anywhere in the drop-down menu, the event will first be captured by the UL, by the top-level element, and uh, the, the, this dot mouse over function will be executed. Don't ask me why, but this is what happens. Um, of course, because uh, IE doesn't support our event listener, we have to, have to add a little if. And which brings us to IE itself. IE doesn't support event capturing. Well, it does. There are some uh, proprietary methods for it, but frankly, I never tested them, so I'm not sure how good they are. Um, but fortunately, uh, it suppo supports the proprietary focus in and focus out events. And basically, these events are exactly the same as focus and blur except that they do bubble up. So, for IE's sake, we add these two lines. Drop down dot on focus in and drop down dot on focus out. And now, magically, our event uh, delegation for, of the focus and blur events works in all browsers. So, this is something you should know about. By the way, uh, the YY team has already incorporated uh, this uh, into the library. So uh, if you use YY, you have uh, no problems at all. It will work fine. But uh, if, you, uh, if you're working with another library or with, uh, with some library-less uh, JavaScript code, this uh, would be a useful trick to uh, keep in mind. As far as I know, this works for all the interface events. This trick, the add event listener trick. However, IE does not always uh, have a proprietary method uh, that uh, helps you out, as in the case of focus in and focus out. So you may run into IE problems then. <coughs> device independence. We have now successfully made our drop-down menu device independent, but there are, of course, more devices than just the mouse and the keyboard. Mobile phones. Personally, I feel that after years and years and years of talk, especially marketing talk, the mobile web is finally coming. We now finally have phones that really and truly support good browsers, which in turn support good HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, good enough to show actual sites on mobile phone. The user experience will absolutely be different from uh, the user experience on a desktop computer, but I, th I still think we should uh, try to do our best to uh, make our websites mobile phone compatible. Um, about two and a half months ago, I was uh, contacted by a Vodafone uh, uh, internet services group, and they asked me, hey, could you please help us out uh, test uh, mobile browsers? And I said, yes, of course I can, because frankly, I was already thinking, okay, uh, the next obvious step for me is testing mobile browsers, but that would mean I have to buy, uh, I don't know, uh, I've got an iPhone, but I need to buy at least an Android and a Nokia, and uh, maybe the new Palm Pre that's coming. I thought, oh my God, this is cost going to cost me a lot of money. No, 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 said Vodafone, no problem, no problem. We've got two closet fools of mobile phones, and you can test them all if you want to. So I went over to Düsseldorf in Germany, and yes, they showed me two closet fools of mobile phones, which I could test. Um, I have not tested all those phones. Uh, I uh, merely selected uh, 19 browsers on 13 phones, uh, which I am currently uh, testing. Uh, besides, I found out that my mother's phone, uh, the default browser on my mother's new phone, is a very, very obscure browser named Obigo. 
So of course I'm going to test that one too. I'm not, I haven't actually done so yet. Um, but um, uh, thanks to uh, this uh, most generous offer by Vodafone, uh, I'm uh, now able to give you some information about JavaScript events on uh, mobile phones. The subject remains terribly tricky, and I'm pretty sure that at least one thing uh, I'm going to tell you right now uh, will uh, turn out to be totally false within a year. But uh, well, I'm doing the best I can, and uh, some information is better than no information at all. Before we go to the actual events, we have to recognize that on mobile phones there are basically three input modes. Um, uh, the first input mode is of course touch. I um, assume most of you are familiar with a touch screen interface on a mobile phone. Uh, the second way is uh, a cursor, or rather a pseudo cursor as I call it. And the third way is, uh, uh, the, uh, this is also the oldest way, the four-way navigation, which basically means you use the arrow keys to navigate uh, through a uh, website, and there is uh, there's no cursor in view. Okay, let's take a look at a few screenshots. Uh, this is the pseudo-cursor input in Opera Mini on a Nokia E71. Um, basically, most of the Nokias uh, support uh, a cursor, although I think you can turn it off as a browser vendor. Uh, anyway, this uh, Opera Mini does not turn it off. Um, basically, what you do here is you use, uh, these are the arrow keys, and you use it to steer the cursor across the screen. And um, uh, when the cursor comes within, say, 10 to 15 pixels of uh, one of the edges of the screen, uh, the browser starts to scroll. Um, the cursor moves in increments of about 10 pixels or something. And it can be very funny that uh, if you have an iframe within here, uh, with a scroll bars that are only three pixels wide, and you have to put the cursor exactly on the scroll bar in order to be able to move, uh, to move it. And I needed that in a certain test I did, and it was not fun at all to try to do that in a couple of browsers. Anyway, uh, most uh, normal users uh, probably uh, will never encounter such a situation, but be very careful with iframes, especially with scrolling iframes on a mobile phone, please. So this is a pseudo cursor input mode. Here we see a typical four-way navigation. Uh, you don't see the button, but it's basically the same as on the previous phone. Um, when you press the, the down key, I've just done so, and then the uh, phone focuses on the next focusable element, which means a link or a form field, basically. And it gives uh, that link or form field a special highlight. If I would press the down key again, the focus would jump to the get, ele get elements by type names uh, link here. And of course, if I now click the middle button, this link is followed and we go to the edit text test script. Um, if there is uh, no link within, uh, no link or form field within, say, one uh, screen uh, height worth of uh, content, then uh, an, an arrow down key will just scroll along. I think most of you uh, will have seen uh, this kind of interface on all the mobile phones. Can also be funny, and uh, this is all also for a uh, four-way navigation phone. This is a Netfront browser on a Sony Ericsson. Um, if I click on the large button here, which link do I follow? I have no idea either. Um, I think uh, uh, some CSS misfires here, because uh, these uh, links are of course heavily styled, but on the totally unstyled uh, homepage of my tests, uh, this four-way navigation works fine. If I uh, scroll down, it uh, puts the, uh, the, the highlight on every next link, and I can perfectly see where I'm going, except that apparently uh, on this specific browser, on this specific phone, um, the highlight is overruled by, uh, by my use of CSS. Well, this is only something you can find out by actually trying it. So um, it was uh, terribly difficult for me to test this uh, specific browser because uh, I have no idea if I clicked where I would go to. And I actually was unable to access at least one of my test pages. Because I, I uh, tried to scroll down, click, oh no, now it goes to the wrong link, back, which also takes a while on a mobile phone, scroll up a bit, click, oh no, no, I go to the link above that, and I tried three or four times, and I thought, well, you know, never mind for Netfront uh, 3.4 on Sony Ericsson K771. <laughs> I mean, the world can probably w do without this bit of knowledge. Anyway, uh, this is just an example of why uh, testing mobile phones is not as easy as it may seem. 
In such environments, in environments where you cannot be sure whether the user touches the mobile screen or uses a pseudo cursor or a four-way navigation, in such an environment, what does mouse over mean? What does mouse out mean? Mouse moved, mouse down, mouse up. And what about click? That's what makes uh, events, uh, events uh, research on mobile phones so terribly difficult. In the end, I decided on a simple test. I set up a test uh, with a div, and specifically not a link or a form field, but a div. Uh, and I attached a lot of events to the div. I tried to touch it or go to it with a cursor or with a four-way navigation or whatever, and I just uh, tried to see what happens. And I will start with the good news. Mm. The good news is that the uh, S60 WebKit browser, uh, that is the default browser on all uh, <coughs> modern Nokias, acts exactly the same as any desktop browsers. If I move the cursor over the test element, um, mouse over and mouse move fire, while the hover uh, styles are applied to the element. If I click on the element, mouse down, mouse up, and click fire normally. And when I remove the mouse, mouse out fires, and the hover styles are removed. This is exactly the same as on desktop browsers. And as far as I know, this is the only mobile browser that does exactly the same as desktop browsers. All other mobile uh, browsers do it differently. Let's take a look at the Opera Mobile 9.5 on an HTC uh, <coughs> touch phone. This is a touch. Um, basically, uh, the, uh, the only thing I'm able to do here is actually touch the test element. Because if I try to use my finger as a cursor and uh, move over the element, it of course means uh, try to scroll uh, the, the page. So that's one of the problems I'm having. Um, basically, you ca your finger is not equal to a cursor when you use touch phones. Um, what happens here is um, that as soon as I touch the element, the hover styles are applied and all these events fire immediately, one after the other. Fortunately, this is the same uh, as what the iPhone does, and I was uh, very glad uh, to notice that because it at makes uh, at least some. Uh, it makes it a little bit uh, easier to handle mobile events. Uh, so, Nokia cursor phones we have exactly as desktop computers, while the latest Opera behaves exactly as the iPhone. Could also be the other way around that the iPhone people have copied the Opera event model. I'm not sure. Anyway, we have to delve slightly deeper into this. What do the iPhone and Opera Mobile do exactly? As soon as the user touches the element, the mouse over, mouse move, mouse down, mouse up, and click event fire, one after the other, immediately, and the hover styles are applied. And when the user uh, touches another element, the mouse out event on the old element fires, and the hover styles are removed. Um, this is about the best you can do on a touch screen. Um, because, uh, and the, uh, the reason they uh, included all these events is basically that so many websites around the world use these events. You have to be able to fire a mouse over event in a way that makes kind of sense, because otherwise some interfaces will become unusable. Now the bad news. Um, this is a BlackBerry Storm with its proprietary BlackBerry browser. Um, I did the same test. I first touched the element. Oh, and the BlackBerry Storm, uh, or Blackberries in general, I'm not sure, have something unusual. They have a touch screen, but in order to actually click, you have to press the touch screen. And um, when I um, went over the element with my finger, the hover styles were applied. You do, do not see that in the screenshot. Uh, and w when I actually clicked on the element, mouse down, mouse up, and click fired in the correct order. This is fun, this is fine, but I wasn't able to get a mouse over, mouse out, or mouse move event from this uh, particular test. Pity. Can get worse, though. Um, this is a net front on a Samsung F700, again a touchscreen. Um, basically, it performed pretty badly. Uh, the only thing uh, I was able to do was fire a mouse down and a mouse up event when I t uh, clicked the test element. Where is the click event? I have absolutely no clue. Fortunately, this is the only browser I found that does not support the click events. All other browsers do, as far as I know. So these are only four of the 19 browsers I tested, and there are hundreds of browser mobile combination in the mobile world. Uh, right now, I'm being very cautious and conservative. 
if I test uh, three uh, S60 web kits on three different Nokias, I uh, treat them as three different browsers. And I'm, um, meanwhile, I've become pretty certain that there is only one S60 WebKit browser and it works more or less the same on all uh, S60 phones. But still, you have to be cautious and there are some differences between uh, one uh, of my test phones and the three others. So uh, I have to do some more research there. So this is only, only the tip of the iceberg. I've shown you now, and more uh, research is clearly necessary. Nonetheless, I dare to give you three general rules for events on mobile phones, um, uh, but please apply, uh, use your uh, discretion when you apply them, because they may turn out to be wrong for certain other phones. The first one is use the click event, and do not use the mouse event, because you, the click event basically works, because it's very simple, Either you touch the element or you click on the middle button, and uh, that means click in almost any phone, except for the single net, for, uh, net front on Samsung that we saw. So this is the first rule. The, the, and in fact, I'm starting to think that it might become time to retire the mouse events altogether from active duty. Um, there are a few exceptions, obviously. The drop-down menu that we saw, it's a sacred tradition that we use uh, mouse over and mouse out events with a drop-down menu. Drag and drop might be another exception. But I think there are not uh, that, all that many uh, interfaces that really need mouse events. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm willing to consider uh, not using mouse events uh, at all. And uh, maybe you should uh, think about it uh, too. It, it will probably not be uh, possible for uh, uh, another one or two years, but uh, it's something we should uh, think about as front-enders. General rule number two is uh, use the resize and the orientation change event if you want to capture the orientation change of a phone. Um, I'm not sure why you would uh, why it would be required to capture that event, because if you write your CSS well, uh, your website will work in any orientation, obviously. But still, uh, there might be uh, unusual situations in, in which you do want to know. In that case, use both the resize and the orientation change event. Orientation change is supported only by the iPhone and the Blackberry, while resize is supported by all operas and all WebKits. And yes, that means that the iPhone support, uh, supports both events. Netfront, finally, does not support either event, which is too bad for Netfront, I'm afraid. General rule three, finally. Um, use key events with caution, and use them only to set up general access keys. Uh, on many uh, mo mobile websites that have been created in the past, you see that um, the programmers wanted to make it easy on the people uh, so they said, okay, uh, if you go, uh, if you press one, you go back to the home page. Two, access to the search menu. Three, the main navigation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's the same as access keys, basically, except that on mobile phones, it's much, much, much more important than uh, than on desktop uh, websites because many mobile phones only have a numerical keypad. So uh, use uh, key events for those uh, general access keys, but do not uh, use them for, for instance, reading out user input in a form field, uh, because some browsers simply do not fire the key events uh, in such a situation, because they start up a special interface uh, that uh, takes over the entire screen and allows uh, the user to fill out the text, and only when they press OK, they return to the website. And no key events fire in that special interface. Uh, instead, just read out the uh, form field's value if you need it. Okay, um, we are close to the end of my presentation. Again, uh, event compatibility for desktop can be found at quirksmo.org slash dom slash events, while mo my mobile compatibility tables, which are very much a work in progress, can be found at quirksmo.org slash n. Well, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you learned something today. And of course, if you have questions, you can ask away right now, or either on Twitter on, on my own site. Thank you. Uh, I'm asked if I can comment on the order of event fire between blur and change. I'm afraid I do not remember uh, at the top of my head which event fires first, but I think it should be the blur event, because the blur event is, uh, says, OK, the user blurs uh, the text box or whatever now, and the change event comes later and says, okay, and the user has, 
has changed something in the text box. But again, I'm not sure if the browsers actually do it in that uh, way. But in more in general, I would say that you should uh, choose either event and not use both, because it uh, just makes uh, things far more complicated. Did I test multiple select boxes? No, I'm afraid I did not. Uh, that's one notorious gap in my uh, event testing. I still have to uh, do that, because I have the feeling that multiple select boxes aren't used very much. Or am I totally wrong in this? Uh, who uh, regularly use mu uses multiple select boxes here? Who regularly uses single select boxes here? OK, so that's the problem with multiple selects. But every time I say, OK, I don't think multiple selects are uh, used much, uh, somebody jumps up and says, oh, yeah, I do use them. So uh, it's, it's a matter of taste, apparently. But uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay, so the question is, uh, if you want to test on mobile phones but cannot afford to buy 20 to 50 mobile phones, uh, how can you test them? Can you use emulators, for instance? Um, I am very, very concerned about emulators. As far as I know, there is not a single emulator uh, out there that really accurately mimics the phone it's supposed to emulate. Uh, I remember one case, it was 10 years back, okay, but uh, it has always uh, remained uh, kind of... Uh, kind of a horror story for me. Um, I was sub supposed to do some WAP research. This is really 10 years back when WAP was still supposed to be a uh, new cool technology. And said, OK, you can uh, uh, download an emulator there. So I downloaded the emulator, started it up. And uh, yeah, well, uh, the website was uh, kind of uh, squeezed into the display. But then I did some random tests, and I figured out that they ju were just running the IE uh, engine uh, in the emulator, which didn't make sense at all. Now, I, I'm absolutely sure that today's emulators will be much better, and that uh, the mobile phone vendors will try to actually run the correct uh, code engine uh, in the emulator, but still, um, I concede that it's sometimes the best you can do, but you have to be very, very careful. And basically what we need is a kind of a mobile test center or something, uh, where people can go to and play around with mobile phones uh, for a day or something. And I really, really uh, advise everybody here uh, and everybody at home who has some way of getting uh, their hands on more than one uh, mobile device to just sit down for a few hours and test stuff. Maybe create a little test page. It doesn't have to be complicated, but just to get a feeling of how mobile phones work and especially uh, how they can mess up your sites. But uh, there is no really, really good uh, answer to your question about mobile testing. Uh, in the end, you do need a mobile phone. You do need several mobile phones. You do need 20 to 50 mobile phones to do the real a good job. Uh, the question is uh, whether the iframe scroll bar problems uh, also apply to GIF? Yeah. Oh, div? Uh, yes, they do, basically. Um, the problem with uh, divs with uh, overflow auto is uh, that the overflow auto rarely works. Uh, the, uh, some browsers, uh, notably the uh, Opera Mobile on HCC I showed you earlier, um, they do show a scroll bar, but it's not actually usable. Um, in general, uh, scroll bars are pretty easy on touch phones and hell to use on other phones. So please, please do not use too many scroll bars uh, in your website, except, of course, for the general scroll bar of the entire page, because uh, that a single scroll bar is the only thing that uh, mobile phones can actually uh, work um, with. The question is whether I'm, I'm going to test more than events. Yes, I am. I'm actually already working on it. And you can, oh, I turned it off. You can look here, coursemode.org slash m. There are, are all the tests I've done to date. I am not. Uh, re uh, I haven't really done a complete uh, set of tests on events or on the CSS optic model or whatever. Uh, I'm just more like doing random tests. Oh, and this is also a good uh, point to mention. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to speak at Google, uh, also about mobile uh, stuff, and they will also put it online eventually. And I kind of see the presentation I'm holding today and the presentation I'm holding at Google tomorrow as a kind of a unit, because uh, I will answer some of your questions uh, in that presentation. But yes, I am definitely going to test everything I can think of on mobile phones. The only problem is that it will take way longer than testing it on uh, desktop computers. Because one of the problems I'm having is, OK, I've got eight mobile phones with me at home. And three of them have Wi-Fi, which is really cool, because then I can actually test something immediately. And the other five, I need to insert a SIM card. Uh, do you know what a SIM card is? 
Yeah, okay, cool. Because I've heard a rumor that Americans don't use SIM cards. And I thought, what? Whoa. Okay, so the rumor is false. Great, wonderful. Um, anyway, uh, and Vodafone gave me only one SIM card. So basically, I'm now trying to get uh, into a good test routine, especially because when you start up the BlackBerry, it takes bloody ages to start up. It takes at least five minutes to start up. So if I do my test really right, I say, okay, SIM card goes into BlackBerry, start it up. Okay, now I take a phone with Wi-Fi support and start testing on that. But sometimes I forget and do the BlackBerry last and then I have to wait for five minutes. So those are the little tricks you learn uh, when you're testing uh, mobile phones. <laughs> <coughs> but I'm try I will try to test as many phones as possible. The only problem I'm having right now is that there are no really good statistics for mobile phone use. I uh, suppose you've all heard uh, that the iPhone accounts for 50% of the uh, advertisement seen on, mo seen on mobile phones. The research was out, I don't know, a month ago or something. Um, which is good to know, obviously. Uh, but first of all, um, that uh, research only applied to smartphones and not to feature phones because we haven't gone into the difference between smartphones and feature phones yet. Basically, feature phones are phones that you can't write applications for. Smartphones are the phones you can write applications for. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that is the basic uh, division. Um, what was I going to say? Anyway, it's complicated. Let's uh, keep it at that. Uh, I'm basically trying to figure out which mobile phones uh, are used most around the world, and I don't have the faintest idea. So I'm hoping to get some uh, Vodafone uh, statistics, which aren't really there. So basically, I'm, uh, I'm doing some educated guesswork right now. And uh, I'm, well, I talk a bit with the Vodafone guys, of course, uh, which, uh, uh, which phone do you think I should test? And they give me some suggestions. But in the end, it's just educated guesswork, I'm afraid. Do the key events work well when you use a combination of keys? Let's say the answer is no. I haven't really tested it. It's uh, also, uh, or do you mean on the normal desktop browsers? Yeah, yeah. Oh, normal yeah, desktop yeah. browsers. Um, yes, they do. Uh, they basically fire separate events for e each uh, key uh, event that goes on. So if you, if you press Shift and then A, for a capital A, it first fires, I have to say this right, it first fires a key down event on the Shift, which of course gives a key code of 16 and no character code, because there is no character. Then you press on A, and that fires a uh, key down and the key press event, because it's a character, and both the key code and the character code are 65, because the key code uh, of a uh, key is always equal to the uppercase character code in ASCII. So yes, that definitely happens, uh, though it might be useful in practice that if you really want to uh, detect, say, Shift A or something, uh, to quietly forget about Shift and concentrate on the A. Uh, because you also have a property, uh, property uh, shift key and alt key and control key, which say, okay, the shift key is now being pressed. And that, uh, that uh, property is also true when you keep this shift key depressed and press the A. So yes, you can definitely do that, but not on mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> it would be far too easy. A path to progressive enhancement on mobile. Um, one, of the, one of the curious points I found is that all mobile browsers support JavaScript. They may not support it very well, but um, basically uh, you can turn JavaScript off as a user, of course. Oh yeah, and that brings me to another point. Um, basically all the browser vendors, of course, want uh, to have JavaScript turned on, and they are mobile browsers because uh, that makes their browsers better. But uh, a browser vendor delivers a browser to a mobile phone vendor who incorporates it into the mobile phone and may change some settings just because they can. Then the mobile phone vendor sends the mobile phone, the hardware, over to the operator because they basically mostly sell their stuff to the operators who may also make some changes in the setting because they can. So um, all the phones I've tested so far have JavaScript enabled but that may not be a fair comparison because they are, these are all test phones and uh, uh, I have no, 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 no way of knowing whether other people at Vodafone have uh, turned on JavaScript the first time they tried uh, the phone. But uh, progressive enhancement, I think, frankly, that it works pretty much the same as on desktop. But what about the variations between, say, CSS support and things like that? It seems like at some level you have to do some server side sniffing and um, you're serving up to who there. Yes, kind of yes, it, the it the kind of pains me to yeah. say so, but yes, I think we need some server-side sniffing for the moment, of course. And of course, the noble goal of it all is to get rid of the server-side sniffing as soon as possible. 
But yes, I am afraid uh, we are going to need that now because, uh, as I will see, as I will show in my Google presentation, you even have to test basic CSS stuff like font uh, style italic. Font style italic does not work on certain browsers and certain mobile phones. So that's fun. But I think I think right now that the principles of uh, progressive enhancement will remain the same. Uh, basically, make sure that your uh, that your website works without JavaScript. Uh, and the only thing that's, of course, really, really different is the tiny display. But basically, some creative CSS will help you uh, get around that. 